uh, the beginning of really a tour at a series of uh, different law schools uh, at the University of Texas, Santa Clara Law School in California, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Cardozo Law School in New York, uh, I think the University of Arizona Law School, um, a series of law schools uh, and a series of places across the country uh, to join with our colleagues in the uh, community of prosecutors, the judiciary, the bar disciplinary groups to address an extremely serious, complex and difficult problem. And that is uh, how do we rem remedy and prevent uh, misconduct by prosecutors uh, in criminal cases. And uh, the occasion for all this, and you will hear from him today, is John Thompson. Uh, John, uh, as you all know, uh, was uh, framed for a murder and a robbery that he did not commit in Orleans Parish, uh, Louisiana. Uh, he was convicted and sentenced to death. Uh, the uh, misconduct uh, that uh, brought this about, as John will explain to you, um, uh, was revealed. His conviction on the robbery in the Capitol case was reversed. He was retried on the Capitol case, acquitted in 25 minutes, then brought a lawsuit uh, about a custom pattern or practice of not disclosing exculpatory evidence against Harry Connick uh, and the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office, uh, won a $14 million judgment, which was affirmed by the Fifth Circuit and then reversed five to four by the United States Supreme Court. John will tell you all about the details of this case, but what remains important about it is that after Connick v. Thompson, uh, it's very clear that civil suits, a civil remedy against prosecutors that commit the worst form of misconduct in an adversarial setting in a criminal trial is not a realistic remedy. It is virtually impossible to, they have absolute immunity. Um, and as the briefs were filed in Connick v. Thompson, our colleagues in the prosecutorial community uh, and uh, state attorney generals filed a number of amicus briefs saying that uh, the, you don't need to have um, civil remedies for misconduct by prosecutors <coughs> because there are other uh, ways of addressing this problem internal regulation by a prosecutor's office, uh, bar discipline, independent entities, uh, so there could be professional discipline or actually a prosecution of prosecutors that commit the worst forms of misconduct. Um, the problem, of course, is that as uh, everyone, I think, involved in the American Bar Association, the criminal justice system knows, whether you're dealing with prosecutors who cross the line, or let me be the first to say it, defense attorneys who cross the line, uh, these other institutions uh, don't work very well. Um, and we have to do something to make them more robust. It is a complex and difficult problem. Number one, it is not easy to distinguish between error, because we're all human and make mistakes, and real misconduct internally within a prosecutor's office, much less a public defender system. Uh, two, once you do distinguish and you find that there is some misconduct, how is that pursued by an independent external entity? Are the bar discipline groups doing enough? Uh, should we have an inspector general or some other kind of independent entity that pursues either a criminal prosecution or bar discipline? Uh, why isn't that happening uh, as much as it should be as the data shows. Those are the questions uh, that we're gonna be looking at it during this conversation. How can we make these institutions work better and deal with this issue, which is a difficult and complex one? Uh, we have uh, with us today to discuss this issue, uh, first of all, my colleague from uh, Santa Clara Law School and the, uh, I guess, the director of the uh, Innocence Project of Northern California, Professor uh, Kathleen Cookie Rodolfi, um, who, along with Maurice Posley and others, uh, produced a report on this issue in California that uh, first appeared in a, uh, a report of the California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice, and now has been published as the Veritas Report, uh, that is very important, and she will begin to address this issue. Then we will hear from John Thompson himself about his case, 
and then we will hear from Professor Angela Davis, uh, who is one of the foremost authorities uh, on this whole topic. She, at one point, ran the Public Defender Service uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, widely regarded as perhaps the best public defender office in the country. Don't let some of my colleagues hear that. Uh, uh, but has also been studying this whole issue of uh, uh, prosecutorial error, prosecutorial misconduct, and of course uh, sees it from the other side, having been uh, a defense lawyer for many, many years and has written a book, Arbitrary Justice, about this issue. Uh, we also were going to be joined today by Judge Andrew Sonner, who was a prosecutor here in the state of Maryland and is now a sitting judge and was former chair of the criminal justice section of the American Bar Association. Uh, but what happens when you invite judges sometimes to press conferences, he has real cases. <laughs> and so Judge Sonner uh, uh, had a matter that came up unexpectedly and he couldn't be here to join us today, but uh, would be, I'm sure, happy to uh, answer questions online uh, and talk about this issue. So. Um, uh, we have uh, it sent out notice, essentially, to uh, our friends at the National District Attorneys Association, the American Prosecutorial Association, uh, 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 and a number of other organizations that have been dealing with this issue, basically to announce the beginning of this conversation, uh, this real serious constructive dialogue on how we can deal with what is definitely uh, a complex issue. I mean, I can tell you I've been a law professor for 34 years, and believe me, I've trained more prosecutors than I have defense lawyers, and it, you know, people just make mistakes. Uh, and the question is, how do you devise institutions that distinguish between error and misconduct, and actually independent entities uh, that can actually do something in the most serious of cases? So, having said all of this by way of introduction, I now present Professor Rodolfo. Um, first, let me say that the Northern California Innocence Project and Santa Clara University are really honored to be in part of this really important campaign. Um, prosecutorial misconduct is a dirty little secret cause of wrongful conviction. Uh, <clears throat> prosecutors, we have a system where prosecutors are rewarded for winning prosecutions and considered losers when at the end of a trial a person is found not guilty. And we have a system where the Supreme Court refuses to hold prosecutors accountable even for repeated, deliberate, intentional misconduct. Really egregious misconduct, as you'll hear more about in the John Thompson case. While the vast majority of prosecutors do their jobs with dignity, honor, and integrity, this is not the whole picture. There's also another reality, and that is that prosecutorial misconduct occurs regularly uh, by a small minority of prosecutors um, across this country. Uh, our respect for prosecutors and the high esteem with which we hold them has also elevated them to a point now where they are really not approachable. It's very difficult to have a candid conversation with prosecutors about the problem of prosecutorial misconduct. And the result of that, I think, is that that minority of prosecutors who are committing misconduct are protected by that silence. Nothing does more to undermine the criminal justice system than a dishonest prosecutor. I, the Northern California Innocence Project has been studying uh, this issue for eight years now. It started when I served on the California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice. We were a diverse commission set up to examine the causes of wrongful conviction to determine the extent to which they may be problems in California. Uh, my colleagues on the commission were prosecutors, law enforcement, uh, defense attorneys, judges, and we decided that we would look at mistaken eyewitness identification, false confessions, problems with uh, jailhouse uh, informant testimony. But when it was suggested that we talk about prosecutorial misconduct, the group could not reach consensus that it was a problem. We really had a stalemate, we had an impasse, and we didn't have any data to inform the discussion one way or the other. And it was at that point that I started studying this issue. In 2010, we established the Veritas Initiative. The initiative is a unique national program that is dedicated to understanding and addressing prosecutorial misconduct. Our first Veritas Initiative report, entitled Preventable Error, was published in October of 2010. The Veritas report is the most comprehensive statewide review of prosecutorial misconduct in this country. 
It's an in-depth analysis of 14 years of California appellate cases that raised the issue of prostitutional misconduct. That led to the, a review of 5,000 cases between 1997 and 2010. Recently, we published our first uh, annual update uh, for the cases in 2011, and we actively monitor prostitutional misconduct cases as they are reported. While the focus of Veritas thus far has really been primarily in California, this is by no means a California problem. There were two other recent studies, one by the Innocence Project of New Orleans. They studied prosecutorial misconduct in Louisiana and really came to the same conclusions that we did. They found the same problems, as did the uh, reporters for the USA Today who did a study of federal prosecutors. Again, uh, they identified the same problems. So what the common problems are are, are one, it is occurring um, 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 at a rate that raises real concerns about the, uh, the, the credibility and justice of our system. Of the cases we reviewed, uh, the 5,000 cases, we identified, found 800 cases where judges had actually found that prosecutors had committed misconduct. Much of it, it appears to be deliberate or reckless, which is actually a good thing because it means it's preventable. It can be deterred. In our study, it, this was an amazing uh, uh, fact. Um, in our study, we found that one third of all the misconduct uh, of the eight of the, of the number of eight hundred so cases, one third of those cases were committed by repeat offender prosecutors. What that means is that we found 107 prosecutors responsible for 251 of the prosecutorial misconduct cases. We found some prosecutors had committed misconduct six times, uh, repeating sometimes the same misconduct without having been uh, publicly disciplined. Accountability, huge problem, almost non-existent. In this period of years that we studied, in that first nine years, we found in the first nine years, uh, we found that not a single prosecutor was publicly disciplined by the California State Bar. In that same period, we'd identified hundreds of cases of prosecutorial misconduct. They, they did cite, however, a few prosecutors for failure to pay bar dues, but not one prosecutor for their misconduct in the criminal case. Another problem is that most of what prosecutors do is unreviewable. For example, of the cases we looked at, those 800 cases, the overwhelming majority of them is error that occurred during a, a criminal trial. And that's obviously because criminal trials have transcripts, the, the proceedings are recorded, there are judges there. So why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because in California, only 3% of cases go to trial. So what, ha what that means is that in the other 97% of the prosecutions, we really know very little. The evidence makes clear that some prosecutors are committing most of the misconduct. And they're allowed to flourish in our system because our system is, of prosecutors is self-contained universe and it protects those er errant prosecutors. And they, we operate in a system where there is no accountability uh, outside of that office. Problems of process misconduct have gone unrecognized and untreated for too long. It's a problem that has to be fixed. It crosses and transcends social class, geography, and political affiliation. It devastates our communities. It's a problem for the justice system and for good prosecutors. It undercuts public trust in a justice system and confidence in the uh, many prosecutors who are doing their jobs every day with integrity. And in this economic downturn, prosecutorial misconduct is responsible for the senseless, mi senseless misallocation of millions of dollars that we all know could be much better spent. And finally, there's a serious public safety issue because, as you know, for every innocent person that's wrongfully convicted, a true cr criminal remains free uh, to commit more crimes. But we have reason to be hopeful. In California, we have really seen great progress as a result of our work. We are already sitting at the table, literally, with, um, with individual prosecutors, county district attorney's offices, members of the California State Bar, and we are engaging in difficult but critically important conversations about what do we do about this problem. 
The State Bar is now investigating misconduct cases. And in the, as I mentioned, in the nine years, they did not, act, they did not uh, publicly address one prosecutor. In, 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 this, in the last six years, there have been seven prosecutors who have been prosecuted by the bar and have been publicly disciplined. <clears throat> there are other ways in which you know, we've seen evidence of success, and it's very encouraging. The campaign is providing us a unique opportunity. We need to get our heads together. We need to collaborate so that we can find ways to protect innocent people from wrongful conviction, citizens from the perpetrators who remain free as a result of wrongful conviction, the system itself, and the many prosecutors who do their jobs every day with honor and integrity. Thank you very much for coming here and for your interest in, in publicizing this very important issue. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is John Thompson. In 1984, the world fell, came to New Orleans with Mardi Gras, which made the city go outrageous with crime. The crime reached shot to the sky. It was so bad that they had to call the National Guards in to try to help settle down with the crime. Um, of a man was killed, Mr. Ray Lalusa was murdered. The informant said I had been involved in it. You know, this is kind of hard to even talk about because I think, you know, what I don't even believe we're here standing here holding this conversation about accountability when he tried to kill me. And so I'm trying to word this into a position where y'all could hear the whole story. So I'm sorry because I'm not with this. I'm with, you know, what's need to be done. But I'm sorry. Mr. Ray Lalusa was murdered. Um, and our informer went to Crime Stoppers and told them um, they knew who was involved. The police made arrest, and I was arrested for the crime. I was threatened. I was brought up on five more counts of armed robbery because I wouldn't confess. I was innocent. Why would I confess to something I didn't do, something I ain't had nothing to do with? So I would wind up being charged with two different crimes, a first degree murder and an armed robbery. Two different crimes, two different descriptions. The murder suspect was a six feet tall, medium built bald head while the robber suspect was five feet seven with an Afro bush. I was found guilty. The whole neighborhood came to my trial and seen it. Everyone knew I was never coming home again. The jury had found me guilty. They had given me the sentence of death on top of 49 and a half years for a robbery. Two felony convictions I did not commit in less than 120 days after my arrest. I was convicted of crap of the crimes. And to top it off, the DA asked for the death penalty. The official letter came to me when I was in my cell in state and I was received my final execution date. It was May the 21st, 1999. My lawyers was desperate at that time, so they brought in a new investigator, saying that they can bring in her, hoping that she'd come in with fresh eyes to look for anything with these last 30 days I had left to live. The new investigator did just that. She started from the very beginning. She opened up the book, and the first thing she seen was the blood request from the district attorney requesting to have my blood withdrawal. Then my lawyers started concentrating on it and called me, gave me a chance to make a phone call to them. When I came out and made a phone call, he told me he thought he found something. He didn't know what my blood type was, but he know that the victim blood type was a particular type, and it wasn't this type that was found on the scene of the crime. I was so happy, I didn't know what to do, because I was thinking I was going to die. I just got fainted. I had a regular heartbeat. 
And so I had never had it, checked it out, and I collapsed it on the floor. I was innocent, but now somebody finally starting to hear me. At the most, this only means that I wasn't going to be executed. It didn't have nothing to do with me um, still being in prison for something I didn't do. All the emotions in me with my irregular heartbeat, I just had to figure out I'm taking off that road now. I am strong out to the world for a new trial with the same mercy. What's going to happen? The judge, who is in that same judge in that same first trial 14 years ago, ordered the DA to turn over all of their files. Another DA from that same office took the stand and testified to the misconduct. When the judge ordered them to turn over the files from 14 years ago, this is what they found in them files. They found systematically exclusion of blacks, jurors. They kept the police reports from the defense. Intentionally concealed evidence, the blood evidence. They knew that money was paid before and after each one of the persons testified. They knew five witnesses seen the murder, but they only revealed it one. A jury took only 15 minutes to find me not guilty when you heard all this. But for the first time, I got a chance to testify on my own behalf. I got a chance to tell my side of the story. I was only 22 years old when all this happened. I was in the jail for two crimes I didn't commit. At the age of 40, <laughs> I'm released. And I could see some daylight. My family, the TV cameras, all was out there. They received me. And then suddenly as it appeared, I was a forgotten story. And you were wondering what happened to the original prosecutors, the men who intentionally crafted their arguments to mislead the jury, the men who checked out the physical evidence from the crime that was used and was never seen again, the men who withheld police reports that nearly costed me my life. Well, the grand jury investigation was called in this case but the law office investigated itself. Suddenly, this case was dropped. Citing statutes of limitations, that ran. And then the investigating district attorney who was investigating the case resigned, citing inconsiderable differences in the Thompson case. At the end, was justice done? The system cannot check itself. It cannot correct itself. And I tell this story so it won't be forgotten. It's a criminal act what happened to me. Attempted murder, kidnapping. You, I don't believe you can stop naming what it is or what happened or what he did. For us to, to say that I was, should have lost my life because they accused me of murder, but yet a person could try to kill an innocent man, I could easily be Troy Davis. If I was Troy Davis, who's going to answer? Who's going to answer if I was killed? Who's going to be responsible? Who, who's going to tell my mother that we killed your son? Thank y'all for having this conversation. Thank y'all for bringing this conversation to y'all tables because I think this is all our problem. This is a serious, serious issue. And I don't believe we need to give them enough power to kill us without us having to say so or something about it, to have some type of balance where we can say, if you kill an innocent man, we won't tolerate it. But right now, the court saying we can kill an innocent man, and we have to tolerate it. So once again, thank y'all for coming here. And Hopefully this open up the debate good enough to change what's going on in our system. Thank y'all. Good afternoon. Um, my name's Angela Davis. I'm a law professor at American University Washington College of Law. 
I'm the former director of the DC Public Defender Service and the author of a book called Arbitrary Justice, The Power of the American Prosecutor. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I want to thank Barry and all of the co-sponsors for inviting me to participate in today's um, press conference. Um, prosecutors, as have, this has been mentioned before, but they perform an important and essential role in our criminal justice system. They decide whether a person's going to be charged, what to charge them with, whether there's going to be a plea bargain, what that plea bargain will be, and they make other really important decisions at every step of our criminal process. And as they make those decisions, they exercise almost boundless discretion, uh, unchecked discretion. They are the most powerful officials in our criminal justice system. And the combination of discretion and power can and has led to abuse. Mr. Thompson's case, the outrageous misconduct that happened there, unfortunately there are many, many cases like his. We live in a democracy, and one of the basic tenets of a democracy is that we hold accountable, we demand accountability from those to whom we grant power, but we have not done that when it comes to prosecutors. There are mechanisms of accountability for prosecutors, but they simply do not work well. They are ineffective. Most prosecutors are elected officials. We have an electoral system. It doesn't work well primarily because uh, prosecutors make these important decisions behind closed doors. Uh, that's, that's the way it happens. That's the way it has to be. But because of that, the electorate is not informed. Prosecutors, when they run for office, don't talk about their charging decisions, their plea bargaining decisions. They don't talk about their policies for turning over exculpatory information. They simply don't discuss these issues. The public is not informed, and so the electoral system really is not effective in holding them accountable. It's even worse for federal prosecutors who are appointed. Uh, very few citizens participate in that process. The, um, as Professor Rodolfo mentioned, um, the disciplinary system doesn't work well either uh, for a variety of reasons. We can and must do better. It's the responsibility of prosecutors not to seek convictions, but to do justice. The United States Supreme Court says that. Those words are, uh, are engraved over the door at, on the Justice Department. Um, and most prosecutors believe that. They take that responsibility very seriously. And that's why it's so important that prosecutors will play a crucial role in this very important project. The forums that are going to take place across the country and with the input and advice of prosecutors, judges, academics, and members of disciplinary committees across the country uh, are an important step towards meaningful reform in this area. So I just want to thank the Innocence Project, all the co-sponsors, and I especially want to thank Mr. Thompson um, because Mr. Thompson, if you had decided, I think anyone would agree that after all that you went through, no one would blame you if you would just get as far away from all of this stuff as possible, as far away from the criminal justice system as possible, given what happened to you, and that you have decided to devote your life to reform of this is really speaks uh, so much about your character as a person. I'm always amazed. I've, I've met so many unfortunately, so many wrongfully convicted people. And I'm always amazed um, at how they don't harbor the anger that I, that I hold. And, it did, and th these things didn't even happen to me personally, but as someone who's been involved in the criminal justice system and takes these things very seriously, um, it, it just amazes me that the people who are victims of misconduct can be so forgiving and can go on with their lives and do the work that they do. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, I look forward to, um, uh, I thank all of the, the Innocence Project, all the co-sponsors, and I look forward to supporting the project as it moves forward with its important work. Thank you. <clears throat> We're uh, now certainly uh, uh, available to take your questions. Uh, just two things. In the materials we've distributed uh, to you, uh, uh, please uh, take a look at this incredible uh, op-ed that John Thompson wrote. <laughs> Uh, uh, which I think really, uh, as Angela said, uh, tells you everything you need to know. Uh, here's a man who lost this case in front of the United States Supreme Court and, uh, you know, honestly and truly could say, I don't care about the money, I just want to fix the problem. 
um, and that's why we're uh, beginning this dialogue uh, and this tour across the country to engage um, uh, with our uh, friends in the prosecutor's offices to make this uh, uh, system better. Um, also, uh, in your materials, hot off the presses, is uh, uh, a, an article uh, from the Yale Law Review, the Yale Online Law Journal, uh, by David Keenan, Deborah Jane Cooper, David Leibowitz, and Tamar Lehrer, entitled The Myth of Prosecutorial Accountability After Connick v. Thompson, Why Existing Professional Responsibility Measures Cannot Protect Against Prosecutorial Misconduct. And I think it lays out uh, uh, in uh, detail and quite persuasively some of the uh, limitations of the professional discipline pro process uh, in terms of trying to redress uh, clear acts of misconduct. Um, one thing uh, I will say that we know uh, would be uh, an extremely important reform, uh, and if Judge Sano were here, uh, he would certainly say this because he, uh, as a uh, former prosecutor, a judge, and uh, most importantly, uh, a former head of the criminal justice section of the American Bar Association, and I think he actually is probably a delegate or holds uh, quite a number of positions. Uh, in the ABA and is greatly respected. Uh, one of the things that the ABA did just a few years ago is they amended the rules of professional responsibility. We have Rule 3.8, which governs uh, uh, ethical responsibilities of prosecutors, and there are two new provisions that uh, uh, are supposed to be hopefully adopted by the states. Uh, one of them, 3.8H, uh, deals with the responsibility post-conviction to disclose credible material evidence of innocence. Um, and then uh, the next provision, H, G, uh, G, no, all right, G is, G is the disclosure provision, H is the provision that says that uh, if a prosecutor uh, has clear and convincing evidence that somebody who has been convicted is innocent, uh, then they ought to do something about it. Now, uh, I think only two or three states really have adopted this, uh, these provisions as written. Uh, five states altogether have addressed it. Uh, so we have 45 states uh, that need to adopt uh, 3.8 uh, G and H. Uh, and that much we know uh, is going to be a focus of this tour and is a very important reform. And you know, we want to engage uh, with prosecutors in the court system uh, and BART disciplinary groups to see which are the best institutions, because we recognize that this isn't a simple problem um, and that we all have to discuss it uh, because it's an important issue that goes to the heart of public confidence in the administration of justice. So having said all that, uh, all of us are available for your questions and uh, we really welcome them. Well, I think John's case uh, uh, illustrates this uh, beautifully. Uh, the issue in Connick v. Thompson was that uh, it was admitted by Harry Connick that there was no formal program uh, or training for the disclosure of Brady material or exculpatory material within his office. And there was a finding um, uh, by a jury that the blood evidence that John was talking about, that is, there was blood that was believed to have come from a perpetrator in this robbery case uh, that uh, was not from John, meaning he couldn't be the assailant that was deliberately suppressed. And uh, a jury reached that verdict, but it also reached a verdict that's what's known as a custom pattern or practice, a so-called Minnell claim. That's a Supreme Court case. But basically, the jury said there was a custom pattern or practice of suppressing exculpatory evidence in this prosecutor's office. Now, the law is very clear that if one is in an adversarial situation, which usually means sometime after indictment when a prosecutor is litigating a case, that while they may commit acts which are plainly misconduct, a violation of the rules of professional responsibility, or even crimes, 
clear subordination of perjury, obstruction of justice, all right, even if they do that, there's no question that they, as an individual, have absolute immunity from civil suits. And there are good reasons uh, for absolute immunity. We don't want prosecutors worrying all the time that every time they do something, they're going to be subject to a civil suit. But in order for the absolute immunity protection, or even the expansion in John's case, uh, not even being able to get relief if you can show not just one individual prosecutor, but a custom pattern of practice in the office, if that is being severely restricted as a civil remedy, then, as all the prosecutor said in their amicus briefs before the United States Supreme Court, we don't need a civil remedy if prosecutors really will prosecute those who break the rules and commit crimes uh, uh, when it happens, and that would have to be ordinarily one would expect an independent institution. What John Thompson's case illustrates, if you ask the same prosecutor's office to prosecute their own, it won't happen. Uh, and what about the bar discipline system? Is that really adequate? And uh, even more, I would argue to you, uh, because I know that there are many prosecutors across the country uh, that are now uh, developing what are known as conviction integrity units. Uh, these are units that will look at miscarriages of justice, but just as importantly, they will do a systematic examination internally, because it's not simple to try to distinguish between what is error and what is actually misconduct. Because you can break rules and be a young, inexperienced person, uh, and it wasn't intentional, malevolent, or uh, even uh, truly a disciplinary violation. But when you have misconduct in your office, that's much more serious, and that's the significance of uh, Professor Rodolfi's uh, data, and maybe she would want to comment on that, because when you have, in California, a small number of prosecutors repeatedly violating the rules and uh, uh, being found to have committed acts of misconduct and nothing is happening, then you know that system is broken. Do you want to comment on that question? Um, maybe have, have more questions about it. Actually, it was a finding that we were quite, I was quite surprised uh, when we set out to do this study that we would find that. I mean, really, a third of, pro of the prosecutors were responsible for, um, were repeat offenders um, among all these cases. So. Uh, it was shocking, informative, and says a lot about lack of accountability that a prosecutor can continue to commit oftentimes the exact same kind of misconduct with ne without ever having been uh, disciplined uh, between, uh, between actions. So there's simply no deterrence. Uh, really, if you think about it, prosecutors ha have a lot of incentive to sometimes cross the line because the value, we value prosecutors for winning cases. And there's really no downside, because the most that's going to happen is you may lose the case. The case may be overturned. But personally, there's no, no consequence for the prosecutor. Uh, and so I think the nature of that structure is the source of a lot of these problems. And it's why we see so much repeat, uh, repeat, repeated misconduct. How do you, uh, weed out the actual instances of misconduct from the claims of misconduct? Because it is an adversarial system, yeah. and everyone wants an advantage. Right. And one of the ways to get, adva get an advantage is to claim misconduct. Right. How do you weed out the actual instances mm -hmm. from all of the claims? Um, well, first of all, the, added, the view was when we started this that prosecutors were saying, oh, everybody comes, you're going to find a million cases because everybody complains about misconduct. And the reality was that of all prosecutions, I mean, of all appeals, there really was a very small percentage of cases where people had claimed prosecutorial misconduct. Um, and it, of the 5,000 cases that we did find where that claim was raised, 800 cases, um, we found more than 800 cases where the courts had actually found misconduct. Now, of course, it's a systematic study. We had to be careful in our definition. So we essentially read the cases, and we, we put it into the, the, the column of misconduct uh, when the, whether, whether there was a decision that it was misconduct. Most of those were the court decide. They're all court decisions. Uh, the majority of the cases were found to be harmless error. Um, and one of the things the prosecutor said to us upon the findings was, well, the harmless error cases don't matter. And the reality is, if those of you who are lawyers, that the decision to find something harmless error has nothing to do with the quality of the misconduct. It has to do with what the strength of the rest of the, the evidence is. 
So then I went ahead and I, and I did a comparison between the harmful and harmless error cases, and yes, we did find that there's absolutely comparable co conduct on both sides. In fact, there's some conduct in the harmful error cases uh, that, is, that is not as bad as what we're finding in the harmless error cases. So that distinction is meaningless, which is why when we talk about misconduct, we talk about all the, the whole identical cases. I think we have someone here that yes. we want to introduce. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, in terms of the practical difficulties of filing bar disciplinary complaints and being able to appeal them, uh, that's addressed at some length in this uh, new article from the, the Yellow Law Journal. Uh, but it's our great privilege and pleasure to introduce Judge Sonner, and we explained that uh, uh, the requirements of real life and real cases sometimes get in the way of press conferences, but uh, uh, if you well, would. I just apologize for being late. I have no prepared remarks, but I'm here very much in support of this kind of approach. I was a prosecutor for 30 years. And Andrew, I've been prosecutors all over the, uh, all over the um, country. Uh, the great bulk of them are as good or better than most of the other lawyers when it comes to their behavior. But from time to time, some of them get overzealous or some of them lack good guidance uh, and uh, they make mistakes and do wrong things just as um, attorneys in other fields do. I think that this kind of a study, looking at uh, what is occurring and what can be done will be very helpful, very helpful to prosecutors. And so. Uh, I apologize for being late. I, I even came, I just dumped my robe with my law clerk and <laughs> ran out and um, uh, came. But they had promised to get my docket clear by 10 o'clock so I could be here plenty of time. Then I got on the metro, and the metro is running both ways on the red line out my way. And so what would have been a 45-minute trip took an hour and 10 minutes. So I'm sorry to be late. But I do want to show my full support behind this. I, I've known Angela and her studies for many years and have seen uh, what a great appreciation she takes for the practical aspects of, of it. Also, I, I haven't talked to Barry, but I saw what the, the press release, and uh, he recognizes what a complex problem this is. It's not something capable of a simple solution, and we really have to see how we balance in their zealous prosecutors with good behavior, and that's what that's going to take uh, a uh, good study and some uh, people with good experience to be able to uh, take a look at that. So, let me ask about a uh, simple solution. Uh, why isn't there some sort of, or couldn't you push for some sort of state laws about open records that, that it would be a legal obligation of the police and prosecutors to make available all the uh, evidence that they? I think that the way it works now is that a lot of prosecutors and police exercise some judgment about what's material or what's, and decide, well, we don't really need to d disclose all the witnesses that saw that. You know, why isn't there some sort of state law that puts it the onus on prosecutors to say you must make available everything? There are some states where there's open file discovery. I know when uh, Judge Sonner was a prosecutor in Montgomery County, and it's still, there's open file discovery. North Carolina now, I think, has the, the most uh, robust discovery laws, and it was as a result of another egregious case like Mr. Thompson's where there was prosecutorial misconduct, and they ended up passing a law, just as you're suggesting, requiring full disclosure. and. That certainly would solve a lot of the, the problems here. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case in most states. There are some states. Florida has open book dis open file discovery in North Carolina, and there are some other states. But I, I agree, that would resolve the problem. But there's a great deal of resistance from some prosecutors for such a law. I, the other thing I, I wanted to say, and I apologize that I have to leave to teach a class, uh, but before I go, I wanted to say that one of the reasons why the disciplinary process has not worked very well is because I, speaking as uh, the former director of a public defender office, uh, when, when defenders and defense attorneys work day to day with prosecutors, they're very hesitant to refer prosecutors to bar counsel, even when they're well aware of misconduct for some pretty obvious reasons. You have to work with that prosecutor's office. You've got to work with them with future clients. You've got to get plea offers. And if, if they, and they have a great deal of discretion. They don't have to give plea offers. They don't have to, to work with you. And if you start referring them to bar counsel, then there's an obvious problem. 
So, so I understand why a lot of defenders are hesitant, particularly if they work with them from day to day. I'm not so sure why more judges do not refer prosecutors, especially when they make a finding of prosecutorial misconduct on the record. There are some judges who have done it. You know, Judge, uh, Judge Emmett Sullivan did it in the Ted Stevens case and in other cases. But very few judges do it as well. And I think that's also a huge problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I do think that this project is going to make some progress towards addressing these issues. And I apologize for having to leave. That's actually one of the incredible uh, findings in uh, uh, Cookie's study is that in California, when an act of misconduct led to a reversal of conviction, uh, it was the law that judges were mandated to refer it to the state bar. And uh, uh, none were referred <laughs> during the 10-year period. Uh, uh, judges didn't even seem to know that that was their obligation. But th this is a terrific question. Uh, that goes to the heart of what is so hard uh, about this issue. On um, maybe it shouldn't be. That, yes, go ahead. Just that you know, one of the good things they said is reasonably hopeful. On that particular issue, uh, Chief Judge Ron George, when he, heard, when he learned that, that they were not complying with this obligation that they had, really took uh, took them took them on. And now there's actually a whole segment in this ju judicial training when judges are trained. They're they're basically very explicitly told this is your obligation and we're seeing a lot more of it. So it's, you know, it's, it's working. But it, it, it took this project uh, uh, to bring that change in California. Uh, one of the uh, issues, though, that you raised directly with your question are, A, what about discovery laws, right? I mean, there should be statutes and it should be clear processes in place so that there are these uh, open file procedures. And listen, Nobody is suggesting for a minute uh, that if there is a danger to a witness, that there are not processes in place that prosecutors can use to uh, uh, time the disclosure of the material with the cooperation of the judge. And you know this is very jurisdiction specific because you will find many prosecutors, even though statutes don't require it, who say, I have an open file policy. If there's any doubt in my mind as to whether something is exculpatory, the best way to solve it is just turn it over, although we take precautions to protect witnesses. Uh, that's one whole approach. Uh, the uh, Judge Wolf, federal judge in Boston, who had a number of controversial cases, uh, uh, set up on his own a system in uh, uh, the federal system up there where there has to be a conference before the trial. Uh, just before the trial where the prosecutors are told, you must look through your materials, you must make sure that you've looked at everything that could be exculpatory evidence. Um, we had a conference on disclosure of exculpatory evidence at the Cardozo Law, uh, Law School and published a whole issue of our law review where we brought in uh, people from the medical community and cognitive scientists on how to get at this problem. Um, and uh, Atul Gawande, uh, the uh, 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 surgeon who wrote that great book, The Checklist Manifesto, um, we, we drew upon some of that work uh, you know, to suggest ways that checklists could be created uh, so people could assist, be assisted in doing their jobs and making sure that exculpatory evidence was disclosed. And I know that uh, in a conviction integrity unit um, in New York City that uh, the newly elected district attorney, Cy Vance, has just set up, uh, that these kinds of checklists are being used. Uh, and that there are conviction integrity units in Dallas, in Houston, in Santa Clara, um, in other offices across the country. And there will be a conference uh, soon at uh, uh, New York University Law School by one of the sponsors uh, of this program, uh, Rachel and Tony Barkow, who are professors there, um, who are going to be looking at this issue in a creative way. So uh, there are. Uh, we have to, it, it's not simple because, frankly, the rule, the so-called Brady Rule of the United States Supreme Court is a kind of nutty one, and that is that something is considered Brady material that should have been disclosed, right, only after <laughs> there's been a conviction. So basically, a prosecutor has to look at this material and say, aha, well, I have to disclose it only if, after a conviction, an appellate court would decide that this was material and important, and there wouldn't have been a conviction if I hadn't disclosed it, right? 
as opposed to simply looking at the material. And there have been a number of rule, proposed rules, ethics rules, by many uh, that maybe it should, should just be uh, a judgment. Is this favorable? Uh, you know, is it from an objective point of view, is it reasonably likely that this is favorable? And then there should be disclosure. But these are exactly the kinds of questions that we hope as we go across the country, because uh, these we're going to get prosecutors, ethics professors, law professors, as well as John Thompson, who will be at each one of these meetings and people from the community to come together and talk about what's going on in the state and other states in the region and what can we do to change it. Tim. Yeah, you're speaking generically about prosecutorial misconduct, which can cover a broad field. But here we're talking about Brady violations, which is Thompson's case, Brady violations. That seems to be the big thing. Now, what's the standard of these kind of things that are involved Brady? Yeah. Cookie, you want to take that? Um, no, I don't have that. Um, it's a significant number, but there, there's, there is so much other kinds of misconduct. Uh, some of the other cases we have misconduct, but I think that's the majority of it. Yeah. It certainly isn't the same as the uh, years. The, the, when you look at the percentages, um, uh, in terms of what cases get reversed, uh, uh, suppression of exculpatory evidence is the leading issue although there's plenty of instances that involve uh, improper closing arguments, right? That happens repeatedly. Uh, so, but the Brady issue, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, in some respects the most serious one because we're talking there about evidence of innocence, and this is what usually is at issue uh, in the cases where after a conviction we find out somebody's innocent. And that's why I bring up again uh, the ABA has already spoken on this issue um, with the amendments to 3.8. So uh, maybe people make mistakes <laughs> during the course of the trial or uh, evidence is not disclosed that it's, it's exculpatory, but after a conviction, that's really where the problem lies because uh, it's not clear to what extent the Constitution requires much disclosure post-conviction. Um, so that's why the ethical rules are of even greater importance now and when you have the American Bar Association saying something pretty simple in a way, and that is, if post-conviction there's material and credible evidence of innocence, that should be disclosed as an ethical matter. And if you have clear and convincing evidence that somebody's innocent, you should do something about it. And that, those rules have not been adopted by the vast majority of states in this country. And uh, 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 all of us who have been involved in this ABA work, maybe Judge Sonner can speak to this, would really like to see that happen. And that is one of the uh, uh, primary purposes of this tour, uh, uh, to find out why that isn't happening and how we can bring it about. Well, yeah, I would just uh, uh, echo the, the, the ethical problems involved in uh, closing argument, opening statement, and a number of other things is where supposedly the law can cure by asking the, the jury to disregard those improper remarks from the prosecutor. They shouldn't be made to begin with. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the, um, what I would say is I went uh, down to North Carolina in connection with uh, a consulting job that I was doing for American University. And we met with the North Carolina prosecutors, and they are happy to live with the statute which is as broad as any discovery rule anywhere in the United States. And it is not causing them problems. The prosecutors say, who say that it will cause them problems are wrong. There's another area that the prosecutors sometimes are <coughs> kept it from information themselves. Now that's happened in my jurisdiction and where the police on their own decide that they've got the proper person and they do not want to turn the information over to the prosecutor. So it seems to me it has to go further. The prosecutor really has to make has an affirmative duty to go to the police and make sure that they tell him all about the case, not just enough to go to the grand jury and to get a conviction. And I think that a study of that kind of, of behavior on the part of prosecutors um, would be helpful too. But what portion of uh, misconduct cases get conviction? Yeah. And what portion Thank you.
Yeah, I, I, I feel very strongly about this. And uh, uh, nothing convicts an innocent person faster than a defense lawyer that's not adequately doing his or her job, period. Um, and uh, a, a lot of the problems that we have in this system is that when the defense function is not adequately funded or vigorous, the system implodes on itself uh, because it is the uh, vigorous defense lawyer representing even somebody who is guilty, <laughs> not just the innocent, who will expose a prosecutor who breaks the rules, who will expose a crime lab, for example, that's not doing its job. I mean, we, the Innocence Project, have been involved in exonerating innocent people and then discovering uh, in, uh, that crime labs uh, were not even doing the tests. So Fred Zane in West Virginia uh, uh, was uh, running a crime lab there, and they were dry labbing it, quote unquote. They were just producing results for more than a decade and not even doing the tests or getting incomplete results. Uh, Houston Police Department Crime Lab uh, was uh, audited uh, by Michael Bromwich, uh, the most comprehensive audit in the history of our country of a crime lab, and he also audited the FBI, if you recall. It's now dealing with the uh, uh, <laughs> British Petroleum uh, spill in the Gulf uh, for the Justice Department. He was an Inspector General in the Department of Justice. Uh, but there were 80% of the cases that in serology cases in the Houston Police Department crime lab uh, were deficient, it was found, in a, in, in a reevaluation. And so it goes across the country. Joyce Gilchrist in Oklahoma City, uh, uh, Joseph Sirwick in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, uh, and I could go on and on and name them. So, you know, it's of course important that the crime lab officials weren't doing any quality assurance or meaningful supervision. But what about the defense lawyers? <laughs> you know, if you're not doing your job, you don't expose it, okay? And uh, so I, I think it is a serious problem that the defense is inadequate and it's not a real adversarial system because uh, uh, the, you know, without funding, without adequate resources, uh, without uh, uh, meaningful standards of effective assistance of counsel, um, the whole system implodes. A and I should say that, uh, you know, we have a problem, obviously, with uh, uh, bad closing arguments by prosecutors, but sometimes uh, there's improper defense arguments that induces uh, improper comments by prosecutors, and it hurts the whole system. Uh, you know, maybe uh, if the defense was more uh, vigorous, they might find some of this evidence uh, that, uh, you know, was otherwise hidden. Uh, so, yes, the, the defense function, you know, uh, is certainly something that we have to look at. And, and the fact is that trying to determine within an office whether you have proper internal management systems to distinguish between error and misconduct is not simple. And so we are in this iteration of our examination going across the country and asking our prosecutorial colleagues to set these systems up, right? Which is not to say that a later time, and based on some incident insights we're going to get as we do this tour over the next year, we have to turn to the defense function and ask the same questions about the defense, although it's not a perfectly symmetrical uh, set of responsibilities or roles, uh, those are still important questions and we hope to learn a lot from this first tour uh, and uh, uh, go back and revisit those other questions. So, well, and of course deal with them just as you asked this question at the press conference, it's going to be asked as we go and do this in law schools and uh, you know, will be addressed and we'll get more insight into it. Defense counsel has uh, had a, an obligation which too often fail. But on the issue of prosecutor misconduct, it's, it's, it's a particular uh, problem because objecting to prosecutor misconduct has to be done in a very particular way. Uh, and what we find is that we found so many cases where the issue was waived. So even though the issue was raised, the, the court decides not, not going to get to it at all. Uh, and that's because the pro they find that the defense attorney did not go jump through all the hoops and take the exact right steps in, in properly objecting to the misconduct. Um, they have to object and have to ask for a curative instruction. Oftentimes, the curative instruction is given by a court, but of course, by then, the cat's out of the bag. It's complicated. 
but I think it's much more difficult to effectively object yeah. in, in these cases. I also want to say that you know I think in some ways prosecutors have a very unusual perspective, a point of view on this stuff. They have a very hard time acknowledging their role in this. And one example I have is that in one of our cases, I got a phone call from a prosecutor. Well, one of the things we did was we posted on a website the names of the prosecutors who were found to have committed harmful error. So I got a lot of calls from prosecutors saying, would you reconsider my case? Which was quite interesting, really, uh, to be in that position. But, uh, but of course, we did. We always did. And in some instances, we agreed with them, and we would take their name. We would say, you know, we would reverse our, our finding. Uh, but one of the calls I got was from a prosecutor who complained that he was listed as having committed misconduct, but in fact the case had not been, been decided based on prosecutorial misconduct. So like I always do, I went, I said, okay, we'll get back to you. I went, I found the case and read the case. And the interesting thing was that, no, the case had been decided based on ineffective assistance of defense counsel. And the basis for that de decision was because that defense counsel had failed to repeat to the failed to object to the repeated misconduct of the prosecutor throughout the trial. And that prosecutor had the, the, the sense that it would be okay to call and complain about that. That to me reflects a certain culture, manner of thinking that is a big part of our problem. Supreme Court, the court has taken an interest in this subject, uh, uh, not to not with outcomes that uh, that you like, but uh, an interest. And one constant in this is the Justice Department's uh, view that uh, prosecutors must have complete immunity all the time. And, uh, taking a very hard line. I wonder if you had any discussions with the Justice Department about uh, these issues. Well, there have been some discussions with the Justice Department about these issues and the Office of Professional Responsibility and how they handle them. Uh, uh, it, it should be said that the Supreme Court did uh, also decide the Goldstein case uh, uh, two terms ago, and that was a case where um, uh, there was uh, an allegation, again, another Minnell claim, uh, that, uh, and also an individual claim, that there was not a process in place in Los Angeles uh, to supervise uh, uh, the use of jailhouse snitches. So basically, uh, uh, in Goldstein's case, the jailhouse snitch had a deal with one prosecutor in Los Angeles County Prosecutor's Office, and the one that was doing the case with Goldstein didn't know there was a deal, and therefore uh, it was not elicited, and that was uh, an error that was eventually discovered, and Goldstein did a lot of time in prison. And the Supreme Court said, uh, that is not uh, uh, the failure to have that kind of system in place, even though you might characterize it in some ways as administrative, uh, uh, or at least the plaintiffs thought it would be administrative. The Supreme Court said, no, no, that's still within the adversarial function, and uh, uh, you know you can't bring a Minnell claim on that basis or an individual claim against uh, John Van de Kamp. Uh, the, the, again you know, what that means, right? The Goldstein decision, the Connick v. Thompson decision is, in, is the reason that we have to have this tour and we have to go back and look at these other institutions. Is there really an independent entity out there, um, and we think maybe look at inspector generals as a model, which once you have identified misconduct will really result in the prosecution of a prosecutor or a professional discipline. Are those systems working well? Uh, I think it's self-evident that they aren't, unfortunately. And what about the internal workings of a prosecutor's office? I think that this in many ways is the most interesting question because Cookie will be the first to tell you that, uh, and I think it was a question that was asked before by Mr. O'Brien about uh, Brady material. You know, we really don't know. Uh, uh, the depth of this issue. Uh, I will be the first to tell you that a lot of times that it's suppressed exculpatory evidence that prosecutors don't turn over, it's the police have hidden it from them and they don't know about it, right? So that may be a reversal for a suppression of Brady material, but it's not the fault of the prosecutor. The Goldstein case is a perfect example in terms of the individual prosecutor. But then you have to ask what kind of internal systems are in place within an office? to distinguish between error and misconduct. Because my colleagues, when we talk about this in the American Bar Association or within the academy, are always saying, look, 
Um, uh, you've got to distinguish between error and misconduct, and just don't go around this country pillorying prosecutors uh, uh, and giving the impression that what happened in John Thompson's case is happening across the board in an epidemic. And that's plainly a fair point. It's not true. We're not saying that. But what we are saying uh, is that we really have to look at these institutions. Nobody can be better at distinguishing between error and misconduct if you have a serious internal system in place than a prosecutor's office itself. And the same will be true eventually, you know, when the defense begins looking at it seriously as well. And so uh, uh, that is the challenge. We're saying look at the internal systems, distinguish between error and misconduct. If you find misconduct, you have adequate independent institutions to either discipline people professionally or prosecute them when it's criminal. Uh, and what about 3.8, changing the rules? Uh, uh, and these are all possible solutions. And if none of these work, maybe you ought to take another look at uh, civil remedies. What's wrong with the civil remedy uh, if you intentionally, intentionally uh, convict an innocent person <laughs> as a prosecutor? Can you narrowly craft a civil remedy for that? Now, I'm not saying that that's the world's greatest solution, but if all these other institutions are failing, maybe you have to revert back to that. That's the kind of conversation that we want, uh, and we want, uh, 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 and we're really going to reach out to our uh, uh, prosecutorial colleagues in each of these different jurisdictions to find out what's actually happening on the ground and what we can do together to make this system work better. You want to say something, Andy? I just say that the time that Imler versus Packman came down, I was very active with the National District Attorneys Association. And John Vandekamp was the, um, was the district attorney for the county of Los Angeles with over 1,000 employees. And for them to have applied the doctrine of respondeat superior to him meant that he was going to be held liable. And if you know John Vandekamp, he comes from Van Camp's beans. He's independently wealthy mm -hmm. and had substantial exposure. Now, it seems to me that the remedy of a civil suit with uh, holding the, the elected prosecutor responsible for all of his employees underneath, it would be a very, very uh, difficult uh, for many, many prosecutors. It might discourage many from going into it. And so I, that's when this decision came down, and now we're going to look for other ways other than using the, the civil suits. And I would maybe want to make an exception for anybody who intentionally uh, convicts somebody as a prosecutor who's innocent. Uh, it seems to me they ought to make him serve the time. I mean, it's a, uh, that's, a, that's a serious, serious violation. I don't know any prosecutors who have done anything like that, but if they ever did, it seems to me they ought to be liable. But I was hopeful that we would be able to develop the set of procedures that would be guidance within offices for setting up the, the other Supreme Court cases, Giles versus Maryland, which was the case in which the prosecutor was lied to there by his police officers. And he went forth as a very vigorous prosecutor, convicted three people, and um, they got the death penalty. They never, they, they, were, they were eventually freed, but uh, uh, in any event, it was the prosecutor who was lied to by the police. I think that he should have had some kinds of procedures that would have been helpful to keep the police from lying to him, make sure they got all the information. Yeah, we, we should say this about John Vandekamp. John Vandekamp was the chair of the California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice that commissioned uh, Professor Rodolfi's report, uh, and uh, he is, uh, uh, truly a great man of the bar. <laughs> and uh, if everybody listened to John Vandekamp about how to deal with these problems, uh, we'd all be way ahead. So uh, 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 I mentioned his name because it was the name of the lawsuit, not because of any particular uh, 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 bad feelings towards John, not, not in the least. Uh, in, in all in the six states that we are planning to, to, to visit in the forums as part of this campaign, we are going to be doing uh, independent research in each of those states. It's not going to be as extensive as what we did in, in, in California, but we will be doing uh, individual research in, in all those states so that when we come to the table, we'll have really specific information about the locations of what the conversations uh, are going to be. Yeah, and two other things I should mention uh, because you raised it in the, uh, the question about the United States Supreme Court. Um, uh, the United States Supreme Court did take a really interesting case that's going to be argued in, I think, the next week or two, uh, called uh, uh, Smith versus Cain, 
and this uh, arises again out of uh, Orleans Parish and deals with the issue of suppression of exculpatory evidence. And many of us reading the tea leaves think, hmm, maybe they took that case <laughs> because of John Thompson's case, uh, which is not to say that on the merits of this, uh, uh, there are extraordinarily um, uh, serious and important issues dealing with the suppression of exculpatory evidence. And uh, uh, it, it, when you read the merits brief and look at the testimony of the hearing, uh, you know, the issue before the court is should the conviction be reversed based on uh, uh, the apparent exculpatory evidence that was not uh, disclosed, uh, the question of who was responsible for that, right? When you read the record, it's... Uh, uh, the question has to be asked, well, uh, did the prosecutors know about a lot of this? I mean, uh, an inference from the record is uh, uh, apparently so, but, you know, that, that I'm sure will be worked out in the courts. Uh, I don't want to officially comment on that, but it's certainly an issue in the case. Any other, uh, nothing else? Yeah, the, and the last thing I should say, and I can't really comment about it, but some of you are going to be seeing it soon, is that there is quite an extraordinary prosecutorial misconduct case, uh, or allegations of it, I should say, in our court papers arising in Texas now of uh, a defendant that was wrongfully convicted named Michael Morton. And the uh, uh, prosecutor who was in charge of that case, uh, I was told before we walked into the room that the uh, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals denied his motion to quash, and I'll be deposing him on Monday. So stay tuned. Watch for that one. Thank you all for your interesting. Let me just come out of it.